Good morning, and welcome to St. Joseph's Parish on this, the fourth Sunday of Easter, or Good Shepherd Sunday. A very special welcome to all of the mothers at this Mass this morning. Jesus, our Good Shepherd, grasps us by the hand. He knows each one of us, and we know his voice. To follow him is to know eternal life. Our entrance hymn this morning is number 315, The God of All Grace, number 315, Please Stand. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Special welcome to our graduates, or our soon-to-be graduates, to be with us today. Good to see both Bellevue Blue and Marquette Red standing together at this Mass just in celebration. Actually, it makes me feel very welcome because my high school colors were blue and red in Marshalltown, Bobcats. <laughs> so it feels very natural to be standing here. Also, big special welcome to our mothers. There'll be a special blessing for you at the end of our Mass today. As we come together, we are mindful of the Lord's mercy and forgiveness. And so let us pause to call to mind our failings, relying on that mercy and forgiveness. Lord Jesus, you raised the dead to life in spirit. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord Jesus, you bring pardon and peace to the sinner. Christ, have mercy. Christ, Christ have mercy. Lord May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life.
us pray. Almighty ever-living God, lead us to a share in the joys of heaven so that the humble flock may reach where the brave shepherd has gone before, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. I'd like to call forward those young people ages four to probably first grade now that the second graders can receive communion, who would like to receive to participate in the children's liturgy of the word. And maybe we could even say three years old now that we're, uh, now that the second graders have to stick around. We've graduated after first communion, right? So today you're going to hear a good story about Jesus being like a shepherd. Do you know what a shepherd does? What do shepherds take care of? sheep right so we're going to be like god's sheep today and he's going to take care of us okay so may god bless you all the father and the son and the holy spirit Reading from the Acts of the Apostles, Paul and Barnabas continued on from Perga and reached Antioch in Pisidia. On the Sabbath, they entered the synagogue and took their seats. Many Jews and worshipers who were converts to Judaism followed Paul and Bar Barnabas, who spoke to them, and urged them to remain faithful to the grace of God. On the following Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. When the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and with violent abuse contradicted what Paul said. Both Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly and said, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken to you first, but since you reject it and condemn yourselves as unworthy of eternal life, we now turn to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, I have made you a light to the Gentiles, that you may be an instrument of salvation to the ends of the earth. The Gentiles were delighted when they heard this and glorified the word of the Lord. All who were destined for eternal life came to believe, and the word of the Lord continued to spread through the whole region. The Jews, however, incited the women of prominence who were worshipers, and leading men of the city stirred up a persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from their territory. So they shook the dust from their feet in protest against them and went to Inconan. The disciples were filled with joy with the Holy Spirit. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
A reading from the book of Revelation. I, John, had a vision of great multitude, which no one could count. From every nation, race, people, and tongue, they stood before the throne and before the Lamb, wearing white robes and holding palm branches in their hands. Then one of the elders said to me, These are the ones who have survived the time of great distress. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. For this reason they stand before God's throne and worship him day and night in this temple. The one who sits on the throne will shelter them. They will not hunger or thirst anymore, nor will the sun or any heat strike them. For the Lamb who is in the center of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to springs of life-giving water. And God will wipe away every tear from the eyes. The word of the Lord. reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, Lord. Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one can take them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one can take them out of my Father's hand. The Father and I are one. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, peace be with you. As I was reading over the first reading from Mass today, I thought about an interaction that I had with a high school friend the few weeks after our college graduation when we were all kind of coming together for a little while. I'm going to talk about this friend. I'm going to give him the name John, even though that's not his real name. Now, I hope this is not a huge shock or scare to our soon-to-be graduates from high school, but it is kind of typical that when you head off to college to gain about 15 pounds your first year. They call it the freshman 15. For some people, it's closer to the freshman 50. But um, <laughs> partly it is because you're the cafeteria in a lot of colleges is a social center, and you're not restricted like you all are in high school to get in and get out at a certain time. You can kind of just go whenever you want to and, and hang out for as long as you want. So after college, my friend John decided that he needed to lose a little bit of the weight that he put on during college, uh, partly because he was getting married and partly just because he wasn't feeling real good. So he started exercising and eating less food, food that was healthier for him in general, and he lost very quickly 15 of the 40 pounds that he wanted to lose. He started feeling really good about his progress and was at a uh, a party kind of talking about the success that he had but in the middle of the party John and another friend got into a very intense debate about a certain subject I don't remember the subject but they were both music majors so it was probably like the best mouthpiece for a trumpet or something <laughs> stupid like that you know but it ended when the one friend called my friend John fat and I remember thinking how unfair it was for him to say that 
especially since this other friend had gained much more weight in college than my friend John and was doing absolutely nothing about it. Still, John sort of laughed it off and tried to move on, but I could tell for the rest of the evening it was something that he just was struggling to let go of. It was kind of this unspoken thing that was still hanging in the room. In the first reading from today, St. Paul and St. Barnabas are in a place called Antioch of Pisidia. Now, there is another Antioch in, in sacred scripture, believe it or not, where the Christians are first given that title, where we are called Christian for the first time. That is in uh, modern-day Syria. Antioch of Pisidia is in modern-day Turkey. It's farther north and west, obviously, because of that. And it is also a much more important city, Antioch of Pisidia is, the one that we're talking about today, because it is the center of the Roman Empire for the province of Galatia. So there's all kinds of Roman civil officials that are in this town, as well as it being a place where a lot of Jews are hanging out for one reason or another. Probably had a lot of business and, and jobs, so everybody kind of spilled into this town. As is now the practice of St. Paul and St. Barnabas. When they walk into town, the first destination that they have is to go to the synagogue. And as we heard in the first couple of verses, St. Paul preaches there. What, we leave, what they leave out, however, is the content of what he preaches. He uses the Old Testament to show Jesus as being prefigured in the Exodus through the baptism that he received like Exodus taking the people of the Old Testament through the Jordan River, or through the Red Sea. And then showing King David as this very important Old Testament figure of whom Jesus is a direct descendant. And then he closes his sermon by talking about the prophet Isaiah. And he challenges everybody in the room to come to faith in Christ through a quote from the prophet Isaiah pointing toward Christ. All of that happens from verses 15 to 42, what, which we don't hear about in the, chap, in the first reading for today, but it's important for us to know, because then it's like a week later. Scripture likes to do this. There had to be stuff that happened in that intervening week. It's not like St. Paul and St. Barnabas went and slept for an entire week and then just came back out. There had to be interactions that they had. But, but what we know is that whereas in the first part, the first week, which we don't hear much about. It's a fairly packed synagogue, but with a lot of Jews and those people who had converted to Jews. In the next week, you not only have them, but you also have the entire town. So it'd be kind of like we get this really good preacher, and one week everybody's there, and the next week the entire, entire town of Bellevue happens to show up to St. Joe's. It's very packed inside this little synagogue in this little town of Antioch. This is seen in sacred scripture as a clear sign that the Holy Spirit is working there. The Holy Spirit is guiding and directing the people to come together in worship of Jesus Christ. But you want to know what the other sign of the Holy Spirit that is present there? There's suddenly a jeering section. Not a cheering section, but a jeering section. People that are going to try and debate St. Paul as he's preaching. Every time they bring up a counterpoint, St. Paul answers their counterpoint, however. You don't debate St. Paul. That's what, thankfully he's dead, so we don't have to worry about it anymore. But you don't debate St. Paul. He's a smart guy, and he knew his stuff, and he was incredibly faithful and filled with the Holy Spirit. To the point that when they can't out-debate him, they go to what are called women of providence who were worshipers and leading men of the city, to throw them out of the province, not even just to kick them out of town, but to get them kicked out of the county, so to speak. They're, they're, they're that much of a threat. But the reaction of St. Paul and St. Barnabas, in my mind, is pretty critical. Because th instead of getting angry and then carrying that anger on to the next place, they shake the dust from their feet. And go on to the next place, as it says, quote, in joy and the Holy Spirit. They're not going to let the being treated roughly stop them from noticing the fact that more and more people are coming to faith in Jesus Christ, even if there are some very loud uh, people that aren't. Now, if you're anything like me, it is very hard not to get frustrated by criticism. I am a person, I was told in a leadership um, 
experience, a leadership training course that I went to, that feedback is always good. Even criticism can be good, and it can be, uh, if it's founded. The, the struggle I have is when someone is just uh, either putting out gossip or else just having unfounded criticism. They just don't like something, and, and they're critical. It's hard for me not to take it very personally, even if it's more general, or to question the worth of doing something if someone is just lobbing all kinds of criticism at me. The question I, I have to return to, and I think it's the question that St. Paul and St. Barnabas have at their heart, as, at their, in their very being, is if what they are doing is of God or not. They believe wholeheartedly that spreading the gospel is of God that getting people to faith in Jesus Christ is of God. But if we are not following God's voice, and that's the criticism, then it's good to listen to it and to, in fact, back off from what we're doing. But if we are following God's voice, if we are, in fact, listening to what God has in mind for us, then we sh can shake the dust of the naysayers' criticism off our feet and continue along our way. If a lot of times what I've experienced is someone can't handle growth in holiness that you have in your life. If you start praying, if you start attending mass, if you start not in indulging excessively in alcohol on, the, on weekends or other drugs or something like that, when you're trying to better your life and trying to grow closer to Christ, other people feel threatened because they've either they're not making the progress that they wish that they would, or they've even perhaps given up on making progress at all, and they can't understand why anyone would try to be better in Christ. So we have to, in fact, make sure that we are following the voice of the Good Shepherd, and not just letting our ego or our misguided search for power blind us to what our true motivation is. But if we are following Christ and seeking to spread his word to the world and, and getting a bit of flack for it, remember that that is just as much a sign of the Holy Spirit working in our life and that we have to, as it said, listen to the voice of God so as to enter into his rest. During this Easter season, we pray the baptismal creed or the Apostles' Creed, which is on page 10 of your Breaking Bread hymnals. And we pray together, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father, Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. On this Good Shepherd Sunday, let us gather our petitions and present them to our loving God. For missionaries in the church, may God protect and guide them, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all civic leaders, may they, with God's grace, assist the diverse communities they serve in living together in harmony, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all mothers and those who have shown us a mother's love, that God will watch over them, bless them with every good gift, and fill their hearts with peace and joy. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord hear our For our graduates, that they continue to practice their Catholic faith and share in the ongoing mission of the church, let us pray to the Lord. Lord hear our for favorable weather for the planting season, let us pray to the Lord. For married couples experiencing difficulties, may God open their hearts to forgiveness and reconciliation, we pray to the Lord. Lord hear our For this community of believers, may God grant us the virtues we need to be his faithful disciples. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord hear our prayer. 
for all the people of our parishes and those who are being remembered in this Mass who have died. Mitchell Kelchin, Florence Mickles, Odello Idle, Donald Wayne, Judy and Carol Sheckle, and Darlene Manders. May they join the angels and saints in heaven singing God's praises. Let us pray to the Lord. Loving and good God, hear the prayers that we offer and give us the grace to live according to your will through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our song for the preparation of the gifts is number 467, The King of Love My Shepherd Is, number 467. Pray, friends, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands for the praise and glory of his name, for our good and good of all this holy church. Grant, we pray, O Lord, that we may always find delight in these paschal mysteries, so that the renewal constantly at work within us may be the cause of our unending joy, through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation at all times to acclaim you, O Lord. But in this time, above all, to laud you yet more gloriously, when Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed. Through him the children of light rise to eternal life, and the halls of the heavenly kingdom are thrown open to the faithful. For his death is our ransom from death, and in his rising the life of all has arisen. Therefore, overcome with pastoral joy every land, every people exalts in your praise, and even the heavenly powers with the angelic hosts sing together the unending hymn of your glory as they acclaim.
You are indeed holy, O Lord, the font of all holiness. Make holy, therefore, these gifts, we pray, by sending down your spirit upon them like the dewfall, so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread and, giving thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and once more giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of the death and resurrection of your Son, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you have held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly we pray that, partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by your Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your church spread throughout the world, and bring her to the fullness of charity, together with Francis, our Pope, and Michael, our Bishop, and all the clergy. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection, and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, blessed Joseph, her spouse, with the blessed apostles and all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, we may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life, and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Jesus taught us to call God our Father, and so as one family, we can pray together. Our Father. Deliver us, Lord, we pray from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. Peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. Let us offer each other a sign of peace. Thank you. 
Behold, the Lamb of God. Behold, him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Please join in our communion song, which is number 323, Gift of Finest Wheat, number 323. Yeah. 
Let us pray. Look upon your flock, kind shepherd, and be pleased to settle in eternal pastures the sheep you have redeemed by the precious blood of your Son, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. Once more, thank you for the presence of the seniors, the soon graduates, know of my prayers for you. Uh, let's give them a big round of applause. Please know that you're always welcome back here. We'd love to see you back here, of course, at St. Joe's and breaks and other times. And if you do go off to college to get involved in a campus ministry somewhere, if you walk in, having just left campus ministry at Loris and Clark, if you walk in and drop my name, you'll have a little street cred. So that's incentive. Walk in and say, I know Father Dennis Miller, and they'll go, oh my, he was... No, I'm just kidding. But please do get involved in campus ministry. Today is a big special day as well because it's Mother's Day. And so if your mother is close by or if a mother is close by, if you can just put your hand on her shoulders and we'll offer a blessing to our moms today. <laughs> Loving God, as a mother gives life and nourishment to her children so you watch over your church, bless these women that they may be strengthened as Christian mothers. Let the example of their faith and love shine forth. Grant that we, their sons and daughters, may honor them always with the spirit of profound respect through Christ our Lord. Let's show our support for the moms among us. And I always think a best way to show a spirit of profound respect to mom is to let her get a nap this afternoon. Just leave her alone. <laughs> The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks be to God. And in the spirit of Mother's Day, roses are available after Mass for a $2 donation, with proceeds going to the Dubuque County Right to Life. Please join in our closing song this morning, number 566, Join in the dance, number 566. Six. 